Okay, I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, this is a Cold War Studies seminar. I am Mark Kramer, the director of the Cold War Studies program. And the seminar today is based on two events we were planning to hold last year, um, neither of which ended up being held because of the pandemic. So the, um, this combines two separate events. We were going to have Norman Neymark, who is the editor of this book. It's not coming through very well, but um, the book that is the subject of today's seminar, Stalin and the Fate of Europe. And the, um, the seminar was going to be presented by Norman coming to Harvard last uh, April. Um, he was also going to be at the Fletcher School. That didn't happen. Then we were going to have a separate panel at the um, Association of uh, the Assis Convention in November in Washington, D.C. That also did not happen. So the, um, today's event is a rescheduling of both of those and combining them. The session will be chaired by Jim Hirschberg, who is going to be, um, who was going to be the uh, chair of that panel in November. Jim is the founding director of the Cold War International History Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center, set up 30 years ago, and is um, the major reason that that project became such a success, a remarkable and valuable success over the past 30 years. And the um, uh, Jim, since the late 1990s, though, has been at George Washington University, where he is a professor of history, and with that, I will now turn over the session to Jim. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for those kind words. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually. Um, welcome to the audience. You don't have to pay a registration fee for today. So I, I hope you're enjoying uh, the free entertainment. Uh, it's a special pleasure to be here uh, to welcome Norman uh, Nymark, um, you know, who I first met again almost 30 years ago around the time he was doing his terrific book, The Russians in Germany, and we encountered each other in Moscow and other, other interesting places. Um, let me briefly introduce the panel so we can move ahead. Uh, Norman Neymark is the Robert and Florence McDonnell Professor of Eastern European Studies at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, he will begin. Then we will turn to Peter Rugenthaler, who's the deputy director of the Boltzmann Institute for research of wars on war's consequences in Graz, Austria. Then Tvertka um, Yakovina, professor of modern history at the University of Zagreb. And then Vit Smitana, who's a senior research fellow at the Institute for Contemporary History at the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. Uh, so uh, for uh, maximum time for question and answers, which you can type into the chat as we are going, uh, let me hand it over to Norman. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. Um, uh, virtually, it's, um, I mean, I'd like to say it's a a pleasure to be back at the at Harvard and the Davis Center because I spent 15 years at the Russian Research Center which is where Mark and I uh, first met um, and always have a sort of warm spot uh, in my heart for uh, that place except maybe during the winter time uh, <laughs> when it's uh, warm here and cold there but anyway um, uh, thank you for coming I appreciate it and I want to uh, get to the book and and uh, talked about it. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues too, by the way. I want to be sure to thank them for reading the book and uh, and for their uh, for their comments. And Jim and I do go back a very long way. And uh, I thank the Cold War International History Project in the book because um, the work there, you know, uh, originated really in that, uh, in, in that time, wonderful, exciting time when we first could get into the Moscow uh, archives. Okay, so this is a book uh, about Stalin and, and uh, his policies towards Europe and European politics uh, after the war. 
Uh, and it really goes along three vectors. Uh, one, um, Stalin's policies. Uh, the second, about Europe and European issues, questions, and policies after the Second World War. Uh, and third, uh, the Cold War. So what I'm going to try to do in this next, I now have 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, let me keep a good track of myself uh, because I can go on a long time. Um, uh, go over those vectors and then very quickly uh, kind of uh, skip over the various uh, case studies. There are seven of them that I use in the book to try to discuss the larger issues um, and say two words about each of those, which is really all I'll be able to do. Uh, those constitute, by the way, the seven chapters uh, of the book. Okay, Stalin. I mean, um, this is in some ways these days the easiest one because um, there's been a lot of research on Stalin. Uh, there's been a lot of new work coming out of the uh, opening of the Stalin archive. It's important to say, it's always important to say there's still a lot we don't know about him and what he thought and what he did. Um, you know, for a lot of different reasons that we can go over. Uh, he is the least known of the leaders of the Grand, Grand Alliance. Um, and there's still a lot of mysteries involved with him, but we know a lot more. And what do we know? Well, we know a few things. Let me just, uh, prominent things. First of all, we know that he was very involved in foreign policy. He was a very um, uh, uh, smart and capable uh, foreign policy maker and leader. Uh, a third, that he was a, he was a micromanager. In other words, he was into everything and he knew about everything, even the smallest details. You know, he would follow sometimes with almost maniacal uh, 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 consistency, and uh, he interfered. Uh, you know, uh, repeatedly with his underlings and that sort of thing. So that's, that's first of all. You know, we hear from Molotov too, by the way, uh, later on, where Molotov says, you know, we were all just, uh, you know, we were all just um, kind of couriers uh, to Stalin. Um, you know, I think he overdoes that a little bit. I mean, Molotov had a little bit more um, uh, power uh, and ability to make policy, as did other uh, members of the uh, foreign policy staff, as it were, of Stalin, which was small uh, and narrow, uh, and sometimes in the foreign ministry and sometimes not. Um, but the, the bottom line is Stalin really controlled uh, what was going on. So when we talk about Stalin in Europe, we can do so, you know, with some, uh, some confidence that this was his, you know, his, um, uh, his policies. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that the dichotomies we usually attribute to Stalin, that is to say, you know, that he was a Marxist-Leninist versus being a realist, you know, that he, uh, he was a Ru traditional Russian imperialist, you know, versus someone who was looking for worldwide communist revolution. These dichotomies don't work, and they don't work very well at all. He's all of those things at once. Um, and, you know, my conclusion in the book, um, you know, is that he's really an ultra realist, a hyper realist, I think I called him in the book. And what I mean by this is that for, for Stalin, you know, the, um, the be all and end all of a good foreign policy was, um, you know, to defend the interests of the Soviet Union and forward them in the world. And of course, he meant his, you know, that he equaled his own sort of perception of these interests with those of the Soviet Union. Uh, and that realism, this really hyper-realism, you know, where you go beyond is the essence of being a Marxist-Leninist. In other words, to be a Marxist-Leninist means to forward the cause of communism everywhere, right? Uh, and to do that, you have to forward the interests of the Soviet Union. So, um, I mean, I look at Stalin really very much uh, 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 as uh, a realist. Uh, the third thing, you know, comes out of long-term work is that there's no long-term plan for, for, uh, for Europe after the war. Stalin, during the war, had various ideas, various things submitted to him by the foreign ministry, but no hard ideas uh, about what should happen uh, in Europe after the war. There was a kind of minimal, you know, a minimal need uh, articulated by Stalin early on, frequently accepted by uh, uh, the Allies, which was that he wanted to regain, you know, those territories um, you know, that he had gained during the Nazi-Soviet pact. 
uh, and that the three bordering countries, uh, major bordering countries uh, of the Soviet Union, Romania, Romania uh, Poland, and Finland, you know, would have friendly, in quotes, governments, right? Uh, you know, the, that on his borders, in other words, there would be no, there would be no, uh, uh, there would be no enemies and no possibility for others, third parties to, to come in uh, through their territory and, and threaten the security of the uh, Soviet Union. I mean, the other thing, of course, was Germany. You know, Germany would be defanged. He wanted to be sure that Germany was, you know, brought to the, brought to the bottom. Uh, and not be able to cause a war again. Although it, he assumed, as did many other people assume, that within 15 years or so, you know, Germany would be would be back at them. So, or 20 years or so. So, so you know, Germany was an important uh, uh, goal of uh, uh, Stalin. Okay, let me do, let me turn. Oh, let me just say uh, finally. Um, you know, Stalin had this idea about people's democracy. I don't want to go into detail here. But this was to be a kind of transitional phase between, you know, bourgeois democracy and socialism. And that all of Europe, all of Europe, and I'm this includes Britain, you know, France, Denmark, uh, all of Europe uh, was to be, uh, was to, you know, have some kind of form of a people's democratic uh, government. That's what he thought would happen. And that's what he wanted to push uh, to happen. Sort of, you know, coalition governments of socialists, uh, and non-socialists who would then push eventually for a socialist government. I mean, there's no question Europe is going to be communist uh, in the end, but this is a long-term uh, perspective, not a medium-term one, and not in some cases, not even a short-term one. Okay, let's turn to Europe. Again, uh, you know, I can't go into detail, but let's just say there's no Eastern Europe and there's no Western Europe in 1945. I mean, it drives me crazy when people talk about that. I mean, this is one continent, uh, a messed up continent, a destroyed continent, you know, people are hurting, uh, old places in, in movement, you know, population transfers, um, uh, poverty, burned up cities, whether it's Eastern Europe or Western Europe, you know, this the whole place is a mess. Uh, hungry, uh, disease, diseased folks, you know, we're having a very difficult time. The extraordinary thing in my point of view, you know, after having worked on this book, is the extent to which European politics revived so quickly. I mean, the ability of Europe, Europeans, and this is, you know, one of the things I'm trying to say in this, in this book, the ability of Europeans to reconstitute their polities um, and, to, and to bring forth capable and competent political leaders was really quite extraordinary. And some of them were quite old. I mean, that made me feel good too. Um, you know, some of them were in their advanced ages. I mean, Renner in, in, in Austria and Palasi Kivi and in, um, you know, Finland and De Gasperi. I mean, these people go back a long time and they're old people and they're coming out and, uh, from the war one way or another uh, and saying, you know, uh, I have a vision of the future and the future is sovereignty. And this question of sovereignty is then central to the book. And the notion of sovereignty, you know, comes out of a war where we have to remember and also a history sometimes of 20 years or even 30 years, you know, of being, uh, of, of, I'm sorry, 20 years of fascism, right? And fascism or, 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 or fascist allies or um, being allies of uh, Germany uh, and um, Italy, that people felt that their, their ability to rule themselves had been, they had been deprived of it. And of course, they were occupied then. Uh, and now they want their sovereignty. And this is what makes, of course, what happens in Eastern Europe so crushing, you know, to people like the Poles, you know, who, who come out of all of this uh, 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 business in the 20s and 30s, you know, with then nothing more than a, a German occupation and a Russian occupation. They want their uh, 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 sovereignty. Um, uh, finally, I want to just mention on the European scheme, uh, the importance of elections. I mean, elections become very important and people turn out for elections, extraordinarily turnouts for elections, especially if you think about turnouts for American elections these days. <laughs> I mean, people are turning out 70%, 75%, 80% for these elections. And the elections are important 
They're important for a lot of different reasons. They're mobilizing people in democratic uh, societies and people are being mobilized. Uh, the parties have reemerged in extraordinary ways, not sometimes with the same names or exactly the same formations, but these are really kind of amazing um, events, these elections, uh, and they're taken seriously. They're taken seriously, you know, by the peoples uh, who, who vote, and they're taken seriously by the Russians uh, who are looking. You know, so if you take something like the Austrian elections in 1945, you know, where the communists just totally underperform and do such a bad job. You know, I mean, uh, the Soviets who have occupied part of Austria and have visions of an Austrian people's democracy are pulling their hair out, especially because the, the communists have done such a, a lousy job in their opinion. And all of these elections, whether it's in Berlin or whether it's in Italy later on or in Finland, you know, really have a meaning. And, and we tend to underestimate those meanings. Um, so, okay, so that's kind of the European scene. The, 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 the Cold War question, you know, the Cold War historiography by now is extremely rich. I mean, it's big, it's a huge historiography. Nobody can actually control it all anymore. I mean, it's amazing how it's blossomed and <clears throat> for good reason. And of course, now we have a worldwide Cold War uh, historiography that goes into the third world and Africa and, and Latin America and this sort of thing. I want to do just a few things with this historiography. I mean, one of the things I want to do is to kind of tamp it down a little bit. I mean, it tends to be imperialistic, like the people who write it, you know, who are Americans or Russians, or who used to write it, were mostly Americans and Russians. And, and for them, you know, of course, of course, we Americans did everything, right? And the same thing on the Russian side. You know, of course, it was we Russians who did everything. Um, and, and, and the Europeans had no say. And for a lot of different reasons, sometimes the Europeans like it that way too. Oh, it's the Russians who did that, or it's the Americans who did that. It wasn't us. And what I'm trying to do um, in this book is try to show a little bit the importance of European agency. And, uh, you know, I don't like that word very much because it's so badly overused, but that's really what I want to do. You know, I want to say the Europeans really had an important role to play in their own history in the immediate um, uh, post-war uh, uh, period. So I'm on the kind of, you know, put this, put this uh, paradigm in, in, in place a little bit, and, and, you know, that, that it's the Russians and the Americans who determine everything. <coughs> um, another thing I want to do is to try to date the Cold War differently. You know, what we get too often is a kind of slip back in time. Of course, there was a Cold War. Of course, it burst forth you know, into terrible rivalry between the East and the West that threatened the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the entire world, you know, nuclear war. But it didn't start in 1945. I mean, we can see the origins certainly in 45, 46, 47. But I'm going to argue in this book, or I do argue in this book, as you know, if, uh, that, it, you know, 48 and 49 is a much better kind of starting point for a Cold War. I mean, we can talk about definitions of Cold War if you want later on, but, but, but the point is I, I, you shouldn't say there's an Iron Curtain in 1945 or that, the, you know, that the East and West was divided into two in 1945. And it just doesn't work. Um, a, a corollary of that is that I want to say there's much more openness in this period. There's much more room for maneuver. There, there's an openness to possibilities of agreement. You know, looking back, it looks like there's simply no possibility. It looks like it was all coming from the beginning. And of course, what historians do, and they love to do this sort of thing, is they can find all kinds of things they want in 44 and 45. The archives are full of it, you know, which show, you know, Stalin was out to take over uh, 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 Europe, or uh, looking to seize as much territory as he could, you know, that he was, um, you know, in no way would a Cold War, would, would, a, would a peaceful, uh, settlement coming out of the war work, while people at the time thought it would work, although some did not. I mean, there were certainly doubters. But even then, again, I'm trying to push the time, the time forward a little bit in, in, in our chronologies and say, look, there are possibilities. There are things that happened. There were agreements made. 
I mean, again, the, the classic thing, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be done with this in a second. The classic thing is, um, you know, this notion of jealous that wherever the Soviets occupied, they, you know, they would build their own uh, social system. Well, that's not true. I mean, it's just not true. It didn't happen that way. And I'm trying to show in this book that there are other possibilities of development. That's really it. So those are the, the three kind of vectors. Now, let me just uh, go quickly over uh, you know, the case studies. And I'm just going to be able to, to, to mention them very quickly. Have I gone over my time, Jim? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes, so let, just let, me just, yes. let me just mention the case. I'll just list the case studies. Okay. The first one's the Soviet occupation of Bornholm, where they eventually pull out and the Danish island and the Baltic. The second one, I book on Albania. I'm sorry, when I talk about the book, it's just impossible to talk about it in 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> the second one's about Albania and Yugoslavia. The third one's about Finland. I'm sure my commentators will mention some of these cases. The fourth one's about Italy. The fifth one about the Berlin blockade, the sixth one about Poland, and the seventh one about Austria. These are all meant to show in some ways. I mean, I'm not a political scientist. I don't believe in kind of picking case studies, you know, on certain kinds of grounds of supposed objectivity. And this, these are for fun case studies. I did them because they showed me certain things about the post-war period in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Uh, you're already generating questions, uh, in my mind included. Uh, so we will come back to you. Uh, but now let me uh, turn to Peter. Actually, uh, most of the books on the Cold War, which come out in the United States, especially in the early Cold War, even do not mention Austria at all. You mm -hmm. will even not find a footnote on Austria. So in Norman's uh, book, um, uh, a whole chapter is dedicated to Austria. Uh, why this is the case, I mean, uh, uh, depends also on Austrian historians um, who may write to less on that. Um, uh, but on the other side, there are, of course, very, very few people uh, dealing with Austrian history at all. And uh, Norman Neymark is uh, one of the exceptions here. So. Um, uh, although I do not agree with everything, um, um, I'll try to give a very brief overview of my thoughts uh, dealing with uh, Soviet uh, policy uh, towards Germany and Austria uh, for the last 20 years. And as you all know, within the last 20 years, uh, so many Soviet materials have become available, especially on Austria in the case of Austria thanks to the uh, cooperation of the Austro-Russian Commission of Historians, um, which I belong to, and um, where within several research projects, many, just uh, thousands of uh, documents have become av available, especially in the early Cold War. So uh, one of the main question of, uh, mainly of Austrian historiography always was, why did the Soviet occupation of Austria did last so long for 10 years from 1945 to 1955? In my eyes, the real question to answer is, how did it become possible to end the four power occupation from the then perspective, Austrian perspective, to get rid of the Soviet occupation? Even uh, Norman Neymark uh, did raise this question in his earlier publications. Uh, that it is quite hard to understand why Stalin did not give up Soviet occupation of Austria since Austria was more or less something like a burden for the Soviet Union. In my eyes, and now I would say we know, it was not a burden for the Soviet Union at all. Oh, you're frozen, Peter. Peter, you froze after not a burden at all. I, I actually have some of Peter's remarks here, so. Peter? Do you hear me? He's back, yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know. So you you broke here. off there. Uh, it froze, you were, we could. Okay. Is it fine now? Yeah, <laughs> well, it was yeah. only very recently, so if you can pick okay. up. 
Ukraine. Yeah, uh, Peter, the last thing to, I heard at least was that um, for the Soviets, Austria was not a burden at all. And then you froze. Yeah. Okay. So um, what I also do not believe is that Austria was not of highest priority for Stalin. I did believe so as well when I started my academic career uh, some 20 years ago. Why? For Stalin, Austria simply was settled by Germans. And the German question, of course, was the most important for uh, the Soviet leadership. For Stalin, Austrians were Germans and Austria was to be treated as part of the whole German question. Austria should be reestablished as a small state, no great power centers in Central Europe should be created several times that Austria was Hitler's first victim. Stalin did so only to argue why an Austrian state had to be re-established. In April 1945, Stalin established, as you know, the provisional government under Karl Renner against the agreements with the Western allies. This and also other issues delayed the beginning of the negotiations of re-establishing Austria as a fully independent state. The Soviet Union was not interested to give up their positions, uh, their positions in, in Austria uh, quickly. As um, I have published a lot on that, as um, Soviet military presence in Austria, and Norman um, um, points uh, this out as well, also guaranteed the presence of the Soviet army in Hungary and Romania. Uh, this was a crucial point, which also was understood by the Americans in uh, 1946, when they at least tried to raise up the Austrian issue first at the Council of Foreign Ministers in 1946 in Paris, which means um, to negotiate first on the Austrian treaty and then only on Hungary and Romania. Um, uh, it was just um, an, yeah, at least a try. Yeah in order not to fix the right of Soviet uh, military presence in the peace treaties with these countries. The Soviets, as you know, refused. For the Americans at that time already, it became clear that the USSR will not make any concessions on their policy of spheres of influence in Europe. The Hungarian communists, for example, Molotov um, personally to Rakoshi, feared a soon conclusion of a treaty on Austria, which would have led to a withdrawal of the Soviet army out of Hungary as well. But the Soviets called them down, um, personally, um, a Molotov Rakoshi. When the state treaty negotiations in fall 1949 anyway nearly came to an end, the Soviets were aware that they would then lose their basis for a further um, presence of Soviet troops in Austria, as well as Hungary and Romania. But also Yugoslavia played a role. Stalin was not ready to give the West a possibility, this is a quotation, to provide political support for Yugoslavia and forbade his delegation to bring the negotiations to an end. So the occupation of Eastern Austria was important for the Soviet Union under Stalin for at least uh, following reasons. For political reasons, of course, I'd mentioned Hungary, Romania, and the German question, later on that a little bit more. For, one could say, personal reasons, of course, not only personal reasons, but because of Yugoslavia, and for economic reasons. The Soviets had found Europeans largest oil field at that time in 1949 in Austria, and kept silence on this. The importance of the Austrian question in the late Stalin era in connection with the German question uh, would of course deserve an extra talk. Much has been written about the so-called Stalin note. Um, me, um, me, myself, I wrote a lot on that, on Germany's reunification proposal on the basis of neutrality. Uh, let me here just, just briefly say that in early 1952, Moscow was not ready to talk about Austria, just the opposite. The Soviet Union feared that the West may push forward the conclusion of an Austrian treaty. Observers already then have stated that Stalin could have confirmed his readiness to give Germany neutrality 
by doing so for Austria before, but he has not, as we know. Stalin was neither ready to withdraw Soviet troops from Austria, nor to give up positions in Germany or even to sacrifice the GDR. All known Soviet documents indicate that the settlement of the Austrian question only became possible after the division of Germany had been secured, when West Germany had joined NATO and East Germany had been under total control of the USSR. So summing up, I do not really agree with uh, Norman's observation that Stalin's policies in Austria demonstrated an unusual lack of decisiveness. I think um, uh, the goal was very clear. Um, the po uh, his policy was, of course, very flexible. Um, uh, but I wouldn't uh, say that it is a lack of decisiveness. In 1955, and I'm coming to an end, the occupation of Austria lost the importance it had had for a Soviet foreign policy concept of the consolidation of the Eastern Bloc. From a political point of view, the occupation was no longer necessary for economic reasons as well. Now, it, Austria really indeed became a burden from, for the Soviet Union from the economic point of view. Austrian politicians, as you know, promised Moscow to declare countries neutrality in the case of the signing of the state treaty, what Austria did so on 26th October 1955. Austrian neutrality indeed is Khrushchev's child, as I called it once. I've written on it, but this is, of course, another story. So um, I do not really believe that this day, this the signing of the treaty, could really have happened earlier, especially. Uh, it does not mean that it could not have happened under Stalin if Stalin would have lived longer, but this is of course um, something makes no sense to, to debate. Okay, okay. that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, let me turn now to Tvertko. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I know everybody here, save for Professor Neimark, so uh, that's new for me. Uh, we never had a chance to, to talk in person, but uh, uh, since I've been reading at least uh, Wayne uh, Wojcinic's books and uh, being from, from this part of Europe, uh, you know that I do know something about people you've been working with and, uh, uh, of course, as a Cold War historian about things you wrote. Um, well, uh, I'm pleased especially with the second vector because I've been a uh, proponent of uh, that possibility of small countries of Europe, especially in my case, Yugoslavia, to do things uh, in sometimes in coordination and sometimes uh, very freely from uh, other big powers, uh, uh, maybe having in mind or thinking that uh, they are working towards Stalin, uh, to use the phrase, um, and that might be the case of, of Tito, especially from 1945 until 1948-49. So everything changed for Yugoslavia after 1948-49, uh, although things were not so secret or uh, that what happened wasn't so unexpected for some of uh, the diplomats that were observing Yugoslavia much more closely. Primarily, uh, I think that John Cabot, who served in Yugoslavia in the first half of 1947, is a very good example. Um, a, a, a American diplomat who was charge of the American embassy in Belgrade, who, and I mentioned that many times, said uh, the place is like, like this in 1947, in summer of 1947, one year before the Tito-Stalin split, he gave a series of uh, talks uh, and the most important one at uh, the National War College in Washington, D.C., explaining that the split between Tito and Stalin might be a possibility or that in his, if his understanding of communism is correct, Tito and Stalin probably are uh, going to, to, to have a quarrel uh, in the future. But unlike all those countries of Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia was the only one with imperial ambitions, I would say, or with uh, serious imperial ambitions, uh, quote unquote, and uh, with the imperial results, uh, which were maybe in tune with uh, something that Stalin wanted. 
but uh, I'll give you a couple of examples that uh, we can talk about uh, whether that was uh, really what Stalin had in mind or, or not. Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslav troops were the first to enter Trieste, uh, a large city in, uh, in Italy, uh, on the 1st of May. Uh, Rijeka, which is now the third largest city in Croatia, uh, was liberated only on the 3rd of uh, May, and the shipyard still being called the 3rd of May shipyards. Um, they've stayed in Trieste for 40 days, uh, uh, only to be uh, pushed, and uh, uh, that zone in the western part of Yugoslavia was divided, as you know, in zone A and zone B, Yugoslavs advocating the extension of zone A in order to encompass all of the Slovenes living in Austria, living in Italy, uh, but that did not happen. However, the border was corrected and Yugoslavia became one of the few countries that had pushed the borders to, to the West. Yugoslav troops entered Austria after the war in pursuit of uh, those troops that were fighting uh, together with, with uh, Hitler. Um, but also Yugoslavia, and that's what you've probably been uh, writing about, Yugoslavia was assisting the communists in, in Greece and Yugoslav uh, uh, battalions were being sent to uh, uh, Albania uh, to assist, uh, uh, to, to help them keep the border or, or to guard the, the border. That is uh, now a question probably is, uh, was Tito doing that uh, alone? or the impulse came from Moscow. And uh, when you look at Tito's first speech after uh, Yugoslav partisans or Yugoslav army at that time was already uh, forced to leave Austrian uh, territory, Tito came to Ljubljana and he used a phrase that for many decades has been uh, uh, interpreted as uh, Tito sending the message to uh, the, the Western powers that Yugoslavia or the Yugoslavs are not going to be like a sh small currency, small uh, petty, uh, petty cash, uh, and that you cannot play games with the Yugoslavs. Um, but uh, the question might be, or it might be, that he actually was talking to Stalin, who did not support the Yugoslavs in Austria, or with, with Yugoslav expansionist policy uh, in Austria, as well as um, uh, uh, in, in Trieste, where the Yugoslavs were left alone and then pushed back to uh, uh, the zones that uh, eventually finished in Yugoslavia and became Yugosl uh, Slovenia and, uh, and Croatia. Um, I mean, many decades later, when Bulgarians were uh, attacking Yugoslavia, the Yugoslavs were never really sure was that Moscow speaking through uh, uh, Sofia and the Bulgarians, or was it something of, of their own or, or what they actually uh, felt in, uh, uh, in, in, in Sofia? The same was with, I would say, with Yugoslavia at the beginning. In 1945, 46, 47, uh, uh, Tito, Tito's Yugoslavia was uh, trying to emulate uh, Soviet Union as much as possible in every possible respect, working towards Stalin, you know, thinking that they do uh, understand uh, how to uh, settle things in, uh, uh, in Europe, and also trying to uh, form uh, the Balkan Federation with Bulgaria and, uh, you know, Albanians even, as you know, being uh, mad that they were not asked first uh, prior to, to Georgi Dimitrov, you know, why why haven't they been included before ahead of, uh, uh, of, of Bulgarians? So um, in that respect, I would say that uh, probably some of the small players, even when they wanted to be uh, a part of, of, uh, of that wave of the future as they saw it, uh, something that we might call nationalism or something that was uh, uh, what you mentioned, uh, a, a sovereignty and uh, the obsession with sovereignty, that might fit here, I would say, with the Yugoslavs uh, 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 very, uh, very well um, in, in, many, in many different ways. Finally, I mean, Yugoslav uh, army was a serious force uh, at the end uh, of the war. And all those operations against the German retreating troops uh, from the western part of Yugoslavia, that was done without any foreign assistance. 
uh, the foreign assistance came in, um, in equipment, uh, sort of, um, until they reached the, the old Yugoslav Italian border. Once the old Yugoslav Italian border was reached, all assistance coming, especially from, from the British, ceased to, uh, to, to come to the Yugoslavs. The Yugoslavs were on their own. And that's probably why Tita was uh, partially mad at Stalin, uh, uh, at Stalin too. Uh, and I would also agree with that, uh, how to, to uh, where to put the beginning of the real Cold War. Because in 1948, when Tito split with the Yugoslav split with the, with the Soviets, uh, it was obviously still possible to leave. It was sti obviously still possible to change uh, the, the situation on the continent. In that sense, uh, I think that Yugoslav policy uh, does fit uh, relatively well to this uh, uh, interpretation. Um, uh, uh, Stalin, uh, Stalin, uh, and you, and that was for a long time, for decades, actually, uh, one of the only a few for, a few sources of Gilas talking to to Stalin when when he was advised uh, or to advise Yugoslavs to accept uh, King uh, uh, temporarily, and then you could step uh, step him in the back when the moment is uh, ripe. But Tito declined. Uh, and they declined thinking, obviously, you know, after four years of fighting uh, and a serious fighting, you know, we are not there to, to play uh, uh, those games. And they actually didn't follow uh, uh, Soviets' uh, uh, advice uh, to, uh, to be more um, cooperative vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis the West or, or this side uh, uh, in the Cold War. So I think that um, we could probably look at the Yugoslav policy through those lenses uh, and that we couldn't justify uh, uh, the, how things evolved uh, in the Yugoslav uh, foreign policy in the first couple of years after the end of the Second World War uh, neatly in this uh, uh, um, system or model you, you proposed with three uh, vectors. I might stop here. Okay, thank you, uh, Tvertko. Right on time, uh, perfect timing. Uh, let me now turn to Viet. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I, I regard the book uh, as an important milestone in our understanding of the process of dividing Europe in the early post-war years. I agree with its uh, major thesis, uh, namely that the local uh, aid local leaders mattered in influencing Stalin's policy towards particular countries, B, that his policy uh, did not unfold according to any kind of the grain of Sovietization and see that, uh, that Stalin was perceptive to the correlation of forces and flexibly responded to the challenges uh, that he faced. Well, interesting is the choice of particular topics, which include also less known uh, episodes of the post-war development. This is uh, particularly true for the first chapter on Bornholm uh, that the Soviets conquered uh, only after the VE day in an attempt to stretch the Soviet influence even to the Western Baltic state, uh, Baltic Sea and a certain Danish uh, position amongst neutral countries for the future. The subsequent Danish tactics uh, based on stressing the principle of territorial uh, sovereignty in combination with friendly uh, attitude to the Soviet liberators uh, paid off when in less than a year the Soviet troops were withdrawn from the island. Yet the long-term Soviet goal uh, failed when Denmark became a founding member of NATO in 1949. Uh, the Finnish leaders were in a much more difficult position and thus uh, strove to convince Moscow that it had nothing to fear from Finland. Uh, at the same time, they, they defended their internal independence bravely and most cleverly. Uh, and this is especially, especially remarkable uh, when we draw a comparison to, comparison to the Czechoslovak leaders. Uh, I entirely agree that, quote, the Finnish fighting spirit uh, uh, as experienced during the Winter War made Stalin ready to, to make a compromise over this uh, strategically immensely important country. 
I am less convinced, however, by the claim uh, that the eventual uh, Finlandization uh, was not an anomaly, but should be rather seen as, quote, critical in un understanding the pers perspectives of Stalin and Moscow uh, uh, on the evolution of Europe as a whole, unquote. In fact, no other country in the Soviet group ended up so happily during Stalin's rule. Uh, due to the shortage of time uh, and the participation and, and, and Peter and, uh, and Tvrtko uh, on the panel, I'm not going to talk about the Berlin blockade, about Austria and Albania. In the chapter on Poland, I very much agree with the words about, uh, quote, the brutal Soviet takeover of the country uh, after the war. Yet uh, surprising is the statement that, quote, ultimately Gomulka can be seen as having won uh, his struggle with Stalin over what he saw as the related issues of the Jews in the Polish party and the distinct Polish road to socialism, unquote. I should think that Gomulka was just lucky uh, that his rivals in the Polish uh, Workers' Party who wished for his liquidation were Jews and their efforts thus coincided with Stalin's campaign against cosmopolitanism. Thus Gomulka uh, won uh, over Stalin primarily uh, through living much longer. Uh, the chapter on Italy uh, is the only one dealing with a country uh, that was clearly beyond the direct reach of Soviet influence. Following his loss in the crucial April 1948 elections, Palmiro Togliatti uh, had to learn how to operate in a democratic system and correspondingly he enjoyed such independence uh, upon Moscow uh, that was incomparable to the position of any of the communist leaders behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, I'm sorry that the book does not uh, address uh, also the tricky question whether a chance for good relations with Stalin was not missed already in 1943 or four uh, after uh, the fall of Mussolini, uh, when the British and the Americans uh, did not wish the Soviets to participate in the administration of the occupied country and uh, provided them with merely a formal role in the Allied Control Commission. Uh, Stalin later used this as a pretext for uh, sidelining the Western allies in the process of determining the future of the, uh, of the other Axis powers when they were conquered by the Red Army in 1944-45. However, was the, the Italian scenario the real reason for the Soviet control of Romania, Bulgaria and Hungary or merely a pretext? I have to say uh, that I find this Italian episode really challenging for my own neo-traditionalist neo views on the origins of the Cold War. Uh, in his effort to trace uh, Stalin's real intentions vis-a-vis -vis countries in his sphere, Norman quotes uh, the dictator's forthcoming, for, forthcoming words about mutual trust and friendship, as well as a new type of democracy uh, addressed to people like Stanislav Mikulajcik and Edward uh, osopka Murawski. I would question the relevance of such statements uh, made before non-communist foreign politicians and would rather agree with Leonid Gibiansky, who called this a regular performance in Russian spectacle. Uh, Norman has doubts, uh, pointing out uh, Hungarian and Czechoslovak non-communist leaders who uh, believed they were competing, uh, quote, in genuine, if new, democracies. And since uh, most of them were not fools, as uh, Norman puts it, uh, Stalin either, uh, quote, used ex extremely clever deception to draw them into his devious uh, post-war political game, or he was, at least for the time being, sincere enough in his convictions about this new and innovative uh, transitional stage, uh, stage to socialism to convince them of his integrity, end quote. The uh, Norman regards the, the latter as more likely, at least until the fallout over the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan. Yet I would argue that most Czechoslovak leaders were foolish enough in trusting Stalin until it was too late and in paving the way for the Soviet domination and correspondingly uh, the communist accession to power in 1945-48. 
Uh, I can extend on that in the discussion, of course. And the Hungarian non-communist leaders on their part at least strove to defend a certain measure of sovereignty against Soviet domination and brutal economic exploitation. The dividing line between Stalin's spectacle and uh, plans amongst his utterances can, in my view, be drawn <laughs> along the presence or non-presence of non-communist politicians amongst his listeners. Thus, one should be most attentive when uh, Norman reproduces Stalin's instructions to Georgi Dimitrov of September 1946, in the sense that the Bulgarian communists should not collectivize agriculture or impose a dictatorship of the party in place of a parliamentary system. Yet, we can also read in, the, in this very pertaining record his urges for broadening of the party and uniting the working class behind a minimal program, as he puts it, while later there will be time for maximal program. In a character, uh, the party will be communist, uh, as he put it, uh, but it will uh, have a broader basis and convenient mask for the present period. All this um, I'm saying Stalin, all this will contribute to your peculiar, tra peculiar transition of to, uh, to socialism without a dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. So perhaps such a convenient mask of the Bulgarian communists was to play an important part in Stalin's broader spectacle. So uh, was there really a window of opportunity for creating a better world uh, that the great powers irresponsibly allowed to be shut? Perhaps yes, but probably on the condition that the Western powers would have been willing to keep retreating and above all fully respecting Soviet domination in Eastern Europe. And what would such an opportunity be worthy or how long could that metaphoric window remain open? Norman admits that Stalin's long-term goals included the communization of Europe and the world or that the post-war new popular or people's democracies should start a long process, 25 to 30 years of a gradual transition to socialism. So perhaps just a chance for postponement of communization, communization and a Cold War was missed. In Norman's interpretation, the common for meeting of late September 1947 in Sklarska Poremba with Zdanov's two camps speech represented, quote, a serious retreat from the ideas of new democracy and separate roads to socialism, end quote. Yet documents found in the Hungarian archives show that Stalin started planning for setting up such an organization as early as in March 1946, as he and Molotov informed Matyas Rakoshi. And the Hungarian communist leader brought back home from Moscow also the instructions that, quote, uh, whenever a country achieves the conditions for the liberation of the proletariat or for socialism, this will be carried out, end quote. Unfortunately, Dor Norman did not take these re revelations into account. Instead, he thoroughly re-examine uh, those post-war episodes in which Stalin seemed to be a, a, at a certain point willing to reach some kind of a compromise either with the Western powers or with the national democratic leaders uh, as in the case of Finland. Alternatively with the local independent, independently minded communists. It is perhaps a task of future research and writing to set these interesting chapters into a broader context of Stalin's European policies uh, that would include also the areas that got under his vicious control right from the beginning, namely the Baltic states, Romania and Bulgaria, as well as Hungary, uh, the specific case of Czechoslovakia, of course, notwithstanding. In that process, he used various in instruments of power to size and de facto rule those conquered territories where the Soviets were not confronted with a real threat of Western or national, such as in Finland, armed resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Vit. Um, thank you all for your comments. So much is already on the table. Let me give Norman uh, a chance to respond to what's already been said. So please, Norman. So how, lo how long will you give me for this? 
uh, as much as you want, but the sooner we can move to further okay. questions and answers, right. the better. All right. Thank, uh, thank you uh, to my colleagues. It's always um, a pleasure to uh, to have people read your book carefully and then and then make arguments about it. And uh, these arguments, uh, almost all of the arguments, of course, I'm arguing with myself. <laughs> uh, all the time. I mean, I had the feeling, um, <clears throat> especially with Peter Rubenthaler's argument, you know, is that these two arguments kind of go through the whole historiography of the uh, Soviet occupation of Austria, you know, and the, 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 especially the question, you know, could there have been a, a settlement in 1949, you know, is something that continues, I think, to be you know, uh, a, a source of lively uh, debate. So I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily argue over, over facts, but how one would construct, you know, that those facts. And that's what I did uh, in that chapter. Uh, and let me repeat a little bit what I, what I uh, uh, said about the Austrians. I won't go into too much detail because uh, we don't want to get um, too closely tied. First of all, uh, it was costly for the Soviet Union to be in Austria. I absolutely disagree. It was costly on a number of number of issues. First of all, the occupation itself cost them a lot of money. And you have to remember, I mean, you know this. I'm not, I'm not using that expression as if you don't know exactly what I'm telling, saying to you. Um, that Soviet Union was devastating uh, in this period. And we're not getting out of Austria. I think most of the articles and work that I've read and what I've seen in archives does not show that they were getting out of Austria uh, uh, enough. I mean, the Austrians were paying for the occupation, uh, but they weren't paying enough. And there was a real problem uh, with the uh, economy of the, of the occupation, especially after the first few years, uh, when um, you know, they'd taken out almost everything that was of value. The oil uh, in the oil fields uh, was coming, and it had a price tag attached to it, and the Austrians were ready to pay that price. In other words, they could have gotten, and many Russians, uh, Soviets, thought they should have taken that um, the, the money that was offered by the Austrians for the oil fields as part, part of the 49 agreement. And you know the, I mean, you know the details of those uh, negotiations as well as I. That in those negotiations, you know, there was a quite uh, uh, clear possibility uh, that the Soviets could have been uh, paid off and gotten out, and that the economy of the oil went downhill after that, and you know, uh, and 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 the oil became less um, uh, important afterwards. Another thing to say about about the occupation that was costly were the soldiers themselves, you know, were exposed to Austria. This was a danger in Germany, and there was a danger in Austria. Uh, and that uh, danger, you know, if you read, and again, I'm sure you have as well, you know, the documents from political officers and things like this, they're very worried about, about exposure to the West. And there's exposures there, both in Austria and to some extent in Germany, but much more in Austria uh, than in, um, uh, in uh, Germany. It's always a danger for them to have that. The third thing to say about Austria is the, co the Communist Party was a mess. And again, you know this as well as I do, it was a total mess. And they couldn't stand the Communist Party of Austria. The Communist Party of Austria wanted to see, you know, the eastern part of Austria taken off and made into a separate state. And uh, Zhdanov and some of the others are saying to them, don't be idiots. You know, we can't do this. We're not going to pull this out for you. You have to win over the Austrian people, for Christ's sake. And they couldn't do it. And no matter what they did, and they went through all kinds of uh, pretzels of propaganda and this and that to try to essentially buy off, win the Austrian population. There was something that we can talk about this if people want, deep and abiding in Austria after 1945 that made them even more um, anti-Soviet uh, uh, and anti-Russian than the Germans. Uh, or you know, the Poles, or anybody else that I've come across. I mean, the Austrians just couldn't stomach this occupation. And the Russians knew this. Soviets knew that. There was nothing, no mystery uh, uh, going on. So they were losing propaganda-wise. They were losing in terms of their self-image. They were losing in terms of almost everything in Austria, I would argue. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's, uh, um, la, 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 la. you know, it's interesting that you said, and I'm just going to point this out, you know, and this is one of the things I'm trying to do in my book, that Stalin established the Renner government. Well, you know as well as I do, and this is one of the points of my book, is that Renner tried to get that government established. He worked his butt off, you know, with the Soviet authorities to get them to recognize him as somebody that's legitimate and then to have an actual government. And people don't know much about the, the German and Austria situation. You're right, uh, uh, Peter, that people should know more about the Austria situation because it's an interesting comparison to Germany. Germany did not have its own government. Austria did. And <clears throat> the reason they have their own government is mostly because of Renner. I mean, it's true the Soviets did it and they did it, you know, when the Allies, Western Allies, were not happy about it. Uh, but the Western Allies eventually bought into it. And Renner, who was, as Stalin said, an old fox, you know, managed to convince the Western Allies, too, that he was somehow useful uh, for them in Austria. Anyway. Um, you know, the, the, it, it is true, of course, and I think I point this out in my book that the armies, uh, you know, that the, uh, the, the uh, occupation of um, Austria was important and written into allied agreements about the uh, Soviet troops in Hungary and Romania. My view of this is it could have been changed easily, could have been changed easily, and that the Western allies would have agreed at a number of points, you know, that Soviets could keep their troops in Romania and Hungary. After a certain point, Romania and Hungary were gone. And certainly after 47 uh, or 48, right? I mean, again, I'm pushing the calendar back. Most people would say after 45. But after 47, you know, it was quite clear uh, that this was the situation. I don't think there would have been any problem. I think that's it. I mean, I've argued a lot with some of your colleagues about this um, uh, especially Muller, Wolfgang Muller, about this. I, you know, I think that I think that with, that was not a stumbling block. Uh, after a while, that they could have changed the agreements and and the and the questions uh, of the of the peace uh, treaties. Um, and finally, I mean, the division of Ger Germany was pretty much secure in 1949, right? There was an East Germany and West Germany form. So the, the, you, you, you don't have to wait till 1950 or 52, you know, to say that there was a division of Germany. I think the German question was more or less settled. I mean, it wasn't settled, but it was more or less clear what was going to happen once the German Democratic Republic, I mean, first the Federal Republic of Germany and then the German Democratic Republic and then NATO were formed in 1949. Norman, I mean, I, I think you should move on to your responses to Tverko and Vit, because because we. Thank you. Yes, this would take a while. I'm having fun. I'm sorry. I know. Okay, I understand. Let me, let me go fast. Um, okay. I, I mean, Tverko. Basically, we agree on almost everything, and uh, uh, you know, my general view is, I, I, I think this is what you're 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 trying to say is we're not sure yet exactly whether Tito was acting on behalf of Stalin or not in his more aggressive. Uh, policies in Albania and in Greece and in Trieste, I don't think he was. Uh, I think he was doing it on his own. I think Tito was on his own. And he was doing this, and I think you put it exactly right, you know, looking, what did you say, working towards Stalin, you know, the working towards the Fuhrer. That's absolutely right. But Tito was wrong. He misread Stalin. He thought Stalin was more interested in Yugoslav expansion because it would represent the expansion of communism than he was. Right. Um, and I think he just miscalculated and he misread Stalin uh, and Stalin, you know, he misread also Stalin's fear. And we didn't emphasize this enough. Or, I mean, I didn't have a chance to that fear of any confrontation with the West whatsoever. So Trieste is a perfect example of that. You know, Albania less so because the West was less interested in Albania. Greece, yes. And that's why, you know, eventually Stalin, you know, was you know, wrote off Greece. So, you know, I basically um, agree with what you were uh, um, uh, saying. And there are no clear, the other thing to say here is there are no clear signals coming from Stalin himself. He's giving mixed signals. This is one of the arguments I made in the, in the 
Russians and Germany book. You know, they're mixed signals, so people can interpret them differently on the ground. And he's trying to pick, you know, between uh, alternatives. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Veet, for mentioning some of the other case studies because I didn't have a chance to do it. Uh, and they are important. Um, uh, I still don't, I, I don't think, I mean, Finland's not an anomaly in the sense that the outcome could have been possible, in my view, in your country. In other words, uh, it's not impossible to imagine a kind of, uh, and it started to happen, right? It started to happen that the Czechs, Czech, the, the Czechs were saying, okay, we'll, we'll give you our foreign policy and security uh, agreement in exchange for our domestic um, sovereignty, you know, our rule of our own country. I believe, I mean, you may disagree with this, but I believe that the crucial difference there was that there's a big and powerful Czech Communist Party, not just a big and powerful Czech Communist Party, but a, a nation, you know, that basically has talked itself into saying that the Soviets were their, you know, their protectors. And they were, you know, they, they talked themselves into it. So you had in 48, it was a coup, you know, but it also was a popularly, you know, it was a popular coup in a lot of ways. There were people out on the streets. I mean, there was, you know, and in Finland, you didn't have that. So my view is that Czechoslovakia could have under certain circumstances, and you know the arguments about uh, the West and its, its involvement here too, not being involved enough, that it wasn't impossible. In other words, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do again is not make this post-war period so inevitable, right, in, in, in its outcome. So I think the Czech case might well have been something in, in Finland too. I think I'll just, um, let me just do one, do one thing here, uh, uh, which is to talk about this issue of people's democracies and Sue and I disagree about it and that's fine. I mean, the arguments that you and I would have if we, if we had a few hours would be almost exactly, I'm sure, the same arguments I've had with some of them with Mark and some of them with my pal Gibiansky in Moscow, um, that um, I still do not, I see evidence, you presented some, I presented some in the book that say this is all a fake. You know, it's all a mask, it's all a spectacle, right? In, in Gibiansky's words. Um, but you see other kinds of evidence too. So you see, again, they're mixed signals and we have to understand that they're mixed signals. I'm not trying to say, you know, I should say I'm, I'm not really a revisionist about this. I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know, that, this, that Stalin was a good guy or that he <laughs> only had happy things in mind. What I'm saying is he's open to different kinds of solutions. And the signals that go out you know, sometimes the signals he sends to the communists are false signals. You know, he's telling them lies, too. So he, he talks to his interlocutors in terms of what he thinks they want to hear, sometimes, right? Um, and he, and, he, and he, he has policies that keep things open so that he can do what he wants with them, especially in this early period when he is so... Uh, again, let me emphasize. Uh, I mean, we need to remind ourselves. No? Soviet Union has lost 27 million people. I mean, Stalin hasn't even come close to admitting that, right? They've lost incredible in terms of their economy. I mean, they're on the floor, right? So, I mean, that's a positive for your argument, uh, Peter, about, uh, about Austria, that they're getting something out of it. I don't think they're getting something out of it. That's why I think they want to get out. Um, so, so, He's open to different kinds of solutions. And if you look at the archives, yes, you can find, you know, now we're going to fool these bastards and we're going to, you know, take over eventually. You can always find stuff like that, but you can find other stuff as well, which indicates uh, that he, you know, he's ready for some kind of deal, that he's open for some kind of uh, different kind of uh, solution that will solve Soviet security problems not cost him money, get him some money. I mean, we haven't talked about finances at all, but get him some, you know, some serious finances so that Soviet Union could be rebuilt. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Norman. We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, Mark, 
uh, authorized me to abuse my authority as chair to make a quick comment or ask a question to Norman. Um, since I'm the ignorant American on the panel uh, who is uh, linguistically limited to English, uh, let me ask a question as a broad Cold War historian. Um, you've, I think, made the point, which I agree with, that the Cold War was not inevitable. But you also write in your introduction that it was unlikely that the Cold War could have been avoided. I'm curious, you describe Stalin as a realist, even a hyper-realist, and I take it you would agree that that's synonymous with Stalin as a pragmatist, you know, that he was willing to consider individual situations. Um, two of Stalin's decisions that don't seem to line up well with the idea of his tactical flexibility and willingness to explore compromises, and also with pushing the date of the Cold War as late as 1948 or 49 for a beginning, are two things you didn't mention. One is in 1946, um, the failure of the international control of atomic energy negotiations at the United Nations. And of course, your colleague at Stanford, David Holloway, has written the um, essential works on this. And in that case, despite probing the Soviets don't seem interested in any sort of negotiation, which sort of implies that Stalin had simply made his mind up that the Soviets were going to catch up and get the atomic bomb on their own hook, you know, uh, by themselves. And then second, in mid-1947, the date at which the irreversibility of the Cold War is usually put is the Soviet rejection of the Marshall Plan. And so um, I guess my question is, do you see any differences in policy, say, on the part of the Truman administration that could have led to a non-Cold War outcome, say, the, the, the broader Finlandization of Central and Eastern Europe that you discussed? Or did Stalin's insistence on favorable terms pretty much exclude um, the U.S. going along sufficiently? So that's a really big question. And um, um, let, let, me, let me see if I can, uh, I mean, that's the sort of essential Cold War question, right? So let me, let me see if I can uh, uh, deal with it. I mean, there are a couple of things to say, maybe, maybe I'll deal with it in pieces. You know, that's my easiest way, to, you know, <clears throat> for me to think about it. One piece is, is, to, is, just to, is just to remember ourselves that, again, in terms of pushing the calendar forward a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. That the speech, you know, about the Marshall Plan in June, right? There was no actual uh, 48, I mean, 47. There was no actual aid that came about until 48. Right. And, and that, you know, the, the arguments came in the summer right, of uh, 47, about who would get the Marshall Plan, who wouldn't, the polls thought, the Czechs thought they would get it. Um, so, so, you know, it's a little bit like the, the, the Truman uh, Doctrine itself, you know, which came in stages. So the actual thing on the ground, you know, the speeches in the parliament, and I would go, by the way, to go back to Viet, I would say the same about the common form meeting, when Jadonov gives this speech. You know, he gives this speech, and there are some you know, immediate effects of the speech. But the actual division of Europe in two parts doesn't come until later, again, that he's describing. So people are, people are what Churchill, you know, in his speech in 46, says an iron curtain has descended, you know, from on the Baltic to the, to the Adriatic. Um, you know, he's predicting, he's prescient, he's seeing what's coming, mm -hmm. uh, if certain other things don't happen. Okay, so... I guess the inevitable question, you know, that was Gaddis's famous statement. I thought it was very, uh, very insightful, um, you know, that as long as Stalin was the ruler of the Soviet Union, a Cold War was inevitable. And what he meant, meant by that, I think, you know, is the paranoia uh, and the fear and the excessive worry about security that Stalin had. Now, could that have been diminished, you know, by the possibilities of U.S. Um, 
uh, being forthcoming. Well, you, you cite them. Unfortunately, I don't have David Holloway's discussion of the, uh, you know, of the, of the plan in my head. Um, uh, but my recollection of that is that Stalin felt he would be, you know, he would be um, uh, left out uh, of an important security uh, guarantee by doing that. Uh, and therefore, he didn't see a gain, but rather a loss. Um, and with the Marshall Plan, I mean, it was clear that the Marshall Plan was designed, I mean, many of our colleagues have written about this, not to have the Soviet Union in it. Um, could there have been ways that the Marshall Plan had, could, could have been put together that would have... Um, you know, satisfied this kind of paranoia on Stalin's part, this excessive view of security, this protectiveness of the Soviet Union <clears throat> and its internal uh, uh, functioning against the West. Could it have been designed in such a way? You know, I'm not sure. All I'm trying to do is set up a kind of alternative way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it's not inevitable, but it's likely, you know, given the difficulties <clears throat> also facing American statesmen. Now, let me just say one more thing about that, if I can. You know, the asymmetrical relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union at this time is more than it has e ever was or ever could have been, right? I mean, again, you have a completely destroyed country with very little capital uh, and no uh, you know, and infrastructure in the Western third gone, 27 million people gone, you know, the flower of Soviet, in quotes, manhood, right? And womanhood too. I mean, many women were lost in the war as well. They were in desperate condition. The United States was at the top of its game. You know, it controlled, God knows, you know, more than half of the world's capital, you know, the, the trade, you know, uh, was completely in our hands. We had an atomic bomb. Um, you know, our troops, uh, we, of course, didn't have as many on the ground nor as experienced troops on the ground as the Soviet Union. But, you know, I, I, my view is that, and there are different points of view on this, is that, is that militarily, the Soviets were in big trouble and they understood it. Um, and, and the result is, you know, we were, we were worried about them. We started to worry about what they would do to us. And I think that was a mistake. I mean, I think we could have afforded, you know, to be more, I mean, you had to be, you had to be hard. I mean, you had to, you had to be canon like you know, in drawing certain kinds of lines. Uh, but, but at the same time, there would have been ways to deal with them that would have been much better, but that's counterfactual history. Sure. And I'm, you know, and I'm trying in this book a little bit to ask people not so much to engage in counterfactual history as to kind of open up, you know, to possible alternatives. Again, historians, you know, something happens, it's inevitable that it happens, right? That's what we do. That's what we, we show, you know, we go back in history and we show that this is gonna happen. Um, and in this case, you know, my view is there are other possibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let me turn uh, briefly to Mark. Uh, you see if you have any comments or questions you would like to make before I go to questions that the floor has raised. Mark? Okay, thank you, Jim. I, I don't want to take much time from other people who have asked questions. So let me just, two quick comments is, um, the first of all, I did write a commentary on Norman's book that appeared on um, H. Diplo back in, I think it was September or sometime, you know, to which Norman responded. So I'm not going to go back over that. The, the Two point, um, first point would be about, uh, with regard to the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, the one thing that Stalin clearly did have an advantage in was geography. That if you're interested in Europe, it matters if you're located alongside Europe versus separated from it by an ocean. Um, so the, uh, that always is looming over things. Um, the second point is uh, with regard to US policy is um, just after uh, Kennan had laid out the notion of containment or what I would argue is sort of uh, more or less his thoughts about 
how to deal with the Soviet Union. So he, he refers in there to um, vigilant counterforce in a series of points. And so you know you can um, construe that in many ways, but Kennan, who was who was certainly careful with his wording, later claimed that he wasn't talking about military responses. I don't know, if I were reading it at the time, I think I would have seen it as a call to take military action. Yet the, the first, or uh, not long after that article appeared in Czechoslovakia, there was a communist, communist takeover, you know, which you already, both you and Vita have touched on. And, um, and the United States did not do anything. The following year, there was a communist takeover in China. And again, the United States did nothing to try to reverse it. So if, if US policy somehow needed to be more accommodating, I'm not sure that it could have been more accommodating than it actually was on the ground in those <laughs> two countries, particularly with regard to China. I mean, um, and we do know that Part of the reason that Stalin turned around with regard to giving North Korea a go-ahead in uh, launching an attack on South Korea is that um, the United States had done nothing with regard to um, China, and and uh, that was one of the factors that that Stalin cited. Um, wasn't the only one, but it was certainly one of them, and and so. To the extent that I see, that I look at the record of what happened, I'm not sure that accommodation is the route I would have gone. Um, it's not to say that a, you know, a vehement militant stance against Soviet expansion would have been good either, simply because of the facts of geography. But, um, but I'm not sure that accommodation would have worked out with the EOA you know, far-reaching accommodationist stance would have worked out with a better outcome. So let me uh, stop there. Um, there are questions that Jim has that have come in from the audience, so I will leave it at that. Okay, we, we, we have- Can I say one thing? Yes, sure, go ahead, Norman. Uh, you may be right, Mark, that accommodating is not the right word. Um, that's not what I meant. What I meant was in, you know, engaging with them, um, uh, making deals, uh, taking advantage of Stalin's pragmatism and his realism uh, and, you know, exchanging X for Y. Uh, uh, I don't, when I say accommodating, I'm, I mean in, engaged and negotiating and involved and ready to spend some money, you know, which we had and they did. Okay. Um, actually, several of the questions posed, I think, have been answered by uh, Norman and, and, and through the discussion. And since we have so little time left, uh, there are a couple of other questions that are more about the Western side of decision-making, which really isn't what Norman is specialized in. But to fill the remaining time, there's one question that I always love in these discussions, and I'll pass it on to Norman now. This is from Francine Hirsch, uh, who asks, can you talk a little bit more about the archives? What were the documents that surprised you the most? Are there any kinds of sources that you think we need to have to the full story? Or do you think we mostly have the full story? In other words, what were your favorite documents that you found? And what are the top documents that you did not find that we should keep looking for? OK, uh, good question, Fran. Uh, I, I can't see you, but <laughs> nice to see you. Um, and I'll see you next week or in two weeks or something, uh, giving a talk here at Stanford. So um, uh, I had a ball with this uh, uh, this project, and uh, you know I think it, maybe it was Mark or or Vit in another context that I should have done more case studies. And you know if I had a, 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 a second life, I would have done more case studies, and it would have been uh, I en I enjoyed this work enormously. And the reason I enjoyed the work enormously is, again, getting into the particularities of the European situation. Once you get into those particularities, you see how active, again, that the Europeans were. So uh, the documents I enjoyed, I mean, I, I liked the, um, uh, I really enjoyed the, the, 
the Stalin papers, you know, I mean, to get into his papers, you know, and to see his stuff. Now that it's not revelatory in the way that I would have liked. And, and, and I don't know what percent, uh, Mark may know better than I, uh, of his uh, fund is still secret and that you can't get into. It's about 25% or so. And while you have the titles of those documents, uh, you're not supposed to have the titles, or maybe you can be, James, I don't know. I wasn't supposed to have the titles. Um, uh, you don't know exactly what's in there. And then you don't know what's not in the Stalin fund. I mean, there's got to be stuff in the foreign ministry, Molotov materials and stuff like that, which I would have loved to see. But I really did enjoy enjoy, I don't know if that's the right word, but I got a real kick out of um, uh, uh, seeing real Stalin documents, seeing him edit things, for example, and how he edits things and seeing, you know, how he rewrites things and rewrites speed. I mean, he re once he rewrote the um, uh, um, uh, Communist Party program. It was in 5051, uh, the great, the British Communist Party, and he just rewrote it. You know, they gave him a draft and he rewrote it. And, and that kind of material, you know, is really, uh, is really, really uh, exciting. And th then there's material that's really incredibly depressing. For example, on the, uh, you know, I worked a lot on Gamolka and I was interested in this issue on Gamolka and, Jew and the Jews. And um, uh, the Hoover Institution managed to get the um, uh, interrogation documents, Gamolka's interrogation documents. So somebody is keeping track, writing down all of his interrogations over a period, must have been about a year and a half. And they're interrogating him about the war, going over and over, you know, the war and the issues having to do with the war and what he might have done wrong. And I, I mean, somebody else pointed this out. I began to have a great deal of admiration for Gamolka. I didn't have a chance to get back to Vitt's uh, question about Gamolka. But I mean, this was one tough cookie, you know, he kept fighting them and he fought them and he fought them, you know, day after day as they kept coming at him, you know, asking the same questions, which is a, which is a, you know, an interrogation device on the part of the Soviet, um, uh, well, in this case, Polish um, authorities, um, uh, uh, you know, police authorities in, in these interrogations. So that was, that was a, so sort of amazing to see the grit and, and the gumption of this man. And even that now mostly published correspondence between Gamolka and Stalin is just amazing. You know, I would have never imagined that. I mean, uh, Jim said, well, what, you know, or maybe Fran, what, what would you not have imagined? I would have never guessed. I would have never guessed that an East European communist leader would write to Stalin in that way and say, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, essentially go jump in a lake. Um, and this is in 1948, right? And, and 49, he, he essentially tells Stalin, no, I'm not going to do what you tell me. It's not what, right. Uh, and then there's the whole separate issue of the Jews where he says, you know, we can't have these Jews there and they're doing me in and, and they're doing our country in. And, you know, it's partly anti-Semitism, it's partly politics, it's partly, you can interpret it in various ways as I think I do in the book. But just that, you know, that um, the guts involved. And Tito, I mean, he's another example. I mean, I didn't work. I got some documents on the Albanian thing. But, the, you know, the Albanian, I had no idea that the Albanians, had, you know, Enver Hoxha, I always thought of, and he was, a bloodthirsty, terrible dictator. And that he is a bloodthirsty, terrible dictator. But he's also, you know, a, a political fighter of the sort that, um, you know, is, uh, is very... Um, is very, uh, I don't want to say admirable, but, but the way he kind of dealt with the Yugoslavs and, and the way they dealt with him and that kind of internal fighting, which was in some, some documents I got from Belgrade on this and some were published, um, uh, you know, we're just, we're just fantastic. So, you know, the whole project, uh, the Finns and, and, and what they did, I mean, it was amazing. I'm, I'm sorry to keep going on, should I stop? Well, well, no, well, no, well no. one more time with the Finns. You know, this guy, Kasi, Kivi, and Zhdanov, you know, they're at each other's throats. Well, we can get the Zhdanov documents. And when you read the Zhdanov documents and how he talks about Kasi, Kivi, uh, unfortunately, I can't read the Finnish documents. <laughs> Some are translated, but I don't read Finnish. 
But it's just a, an astonishing, for someone who kind of grew up with Brzezinski and with Seton Watson and with you know all of these kind of Soviets taking over Eastern Europe stuff, to see the fighting, yeah, even when they lose, you know, is uh, an extraordinary uh, is an extraordinary uh, thing. Okay, it's two o'clock. Uh, Mark, uh, can we go Just, over? Just um, Norman, I, I have a question that uh, Nadia Buyajiva submitted, which is, um, to what extent did Stalin's actions lead to the formation of NATO? Say it again. To what extent did Stalin's actions lead to the formation of NATO? That is, oh, is one of Stalin's right. most lasting legacies in Europe, the existence of NATO. Clearly. Yeah, no, I think there's no question about that. I, you know, um, there's no doubt about it. Although, again, it's important to point out already in 1945 that the, the French, uh, Benelux, um, and England are talking about a defense community. I mean, it never comes to fruition, um, but they already understand that for the Germans, they need protection. And some of NATO, not all of it, but you remember that, what was that old statement, you know, to keep the, keep the Soviets out, the, the, the Germans down, and the Americans the American in. Yes. A lot of that is true. So, meaning it's not just keeping the Soviets out, it's keeping the Germans down. And, and that's an important part of the origins of NATO. Um, and so uh, uh, that, that's all that. Otherwise, absolutely. Norman, one last thing. You know, the other half of the question from Francine was what you didn't find that you would most like to, and that and that causes me to ask you: Are we ever going to find Stalin tapes? Are we ever going to hear his voice? And for that matter, Roosevelt and Churchill's voice from Tehran and or Yalta. Or have the tapes disintegrated? Well, I don't think they're tapes, but I mean, you know, you would love to have a diary or some kind of diary kind of uh, document. You know, we don't know that that doesn't exist, but it seems really unlikely to me that, that you know, anybody was allowed to take them. We know that Poskobyshov, you know, his secretary was not allowed to, to take notes. I mean, we know that he didn't like people writing things down around him. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, so, but, but these questions, you know, about people's democracy and that kind of thing, I don't think will ever be settled. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever be settled to anybody's satisfaction because again, you can find things in the archives that support both points of view. And what you have to do is take the actions on the ground. The actions on the ground support the fact that, you know, maybe this wasn't so much, um, that, that this was a fake uh, because eventually, of course, they did take over. And that also, you know, contributes to that. Well, well clearly, Norman, uh, we would all like to have extra lifetime so you could do more case studies and we could read them. Um, but it's uh, well after 2 p.m. So I think we should probably come to a finish. I'd like to thank all of the participants, especially Norman. Uh, by the way, I highly recommend that H. Diplo uh, roundtable that appeared a few months back that Mark and some others contributed to. Um, and thank you very much to the audience. And, uh, and, Mark, I, and let me say, more? for my part, I want to thank Jim. Back when, in the 1990s, when the Cold War International History Bulletin was coming out, um, some of the articles in there would have these editor's notes in them, which was Jim inserting <laughs> points into there. So I thought he was going to be doing that, but he was remarkably restrained to it. <laughs> Uh, for a change. Actually conducted it without intervening too much. I, I actually would have liked some of those editor's notes today. But anyway, thank you very much, Jim, and to Norman and to Veet and to Petko and to Peter.